Um, uh, I'm Bryce Kokenauer. I'll tell a little about myself in just a moment. Uh, hosting us is um, Katie, and Katie's worked for Reaper quite a long time. Uh, and she works. Uh, and she you works. should be all set, by the way. I, I went ahead and gave you host after I started the recording. Okay. Um, I might need you to start the poll, though. Okay. Is the question and answer thing showing up over the PowerPoint? Yeah. I'm still seeing you. Oh, I didn't hit share. It was something small. Are we seeing the screen? Yes, we're seeing the PowerPoint. Okay, good. And then to do the pool, what do I do? There, you should just, when you go down to the bottom of the screen, you know, there should be like a participant's question and answer. There should be a start poll. Okay. Second here. Okay, looking for the start poll now, just a moment. Sorry, we're all in the same room running different classes. Uh, I'm just muting my mic whenever I'm not talking. Oh, no problem. So we've got um, question and answer, is that it? Or is there, I see mute, stop video, participants. I'm gonna steal host back for a second. Okay, sorry. Are we good now? Where's the chat thing? So when she, yeah, go over and that. There we go. More. It's flashing right now. Chat. There we go. All right. There we go. Thank you. Now I've got the chat up and we're good though. All right. Well, again, I'm Bryce Kokenauer. I started painting in um, in high school in about 2014 we um, had a friend that we started playing D D and then we went on to Warhammer and started painting there and uh, really liked painting and continued to get better um, this class sort of started as a well here and also please uh, put your questions in uh, the question and answer section so we make sure we answer those uh, this class works really good if we are able to communicate back and forth and so if you have questions uh, it'll be helpful to others to do that and we can keep track of the questions if they're in the question and answer uh, file um, katie will be watching the chat to see if there's anything else in there um, and then we can discuss that um, so backing up a little bit, the reason I started this class was trying to figure out a class I could do that was different than other classes that existed at this. And uh, talking with Aaron Lovejoy and Caleb was in back, these are my friends, and we figured out that um, uh, there's a lot of starting stuff and knowledge that you end up having to learn, and it's a pretty steep learning curve. And what happened is I had a, a friend that uh, started painting so I just started to, uh, to teach him and so it took a lot of time and just showed him a bunch of things. And then with in less than a year, he was already painting at my level. And I was like, wow, 
So this took me, you know, 15 years to get to this point, and then we're able to jumpstart him. And so my hope is by going over some of this stuff, we can jumpstart everybody and uh, and save you some time and move you forward in this, you know, painting journey. So I'm grateful that you're here and, and I hope that you'll learn something. And if you have questions, it'll be helpful to hear those and everybody else can share with us too. So I'd like to start with uh, this. We're gonna um, go through the whole process of, of getting a model ready and, and, and some ideas of you know, what to look for and things that were stumbling blocks for me and with the hope that it'll help you in this process. So let me... Okay, so I'd like to start off with tools. So one of the first things we do, we get a brand new mini, we have to clean the mini. I've, uh, so when a miniature is made, it's put in a two part mold. And uh, when they remove that mold, there's typically a seam where the two halves of the mold meet and that leaves a line on your miniature. Uh, for you know, table type top stuff, you maybe won't worry about the mold lines, but if you're wanting to do a competition miniature or a miniature that you really want to show off your skills, you would normally get rid of these mold lines. And um, judging uh, with Michael, Michael Proctor has allowed us to help judge with the, the judging process. And it's, it's really sad when you have a beautiful paint job and there's like a, a seam right across the face or something that's very obvious. And so sometimes maybe you wouldn't clean the whole miniature, but you would clean the, uh, at least the part you could see. Um, so there's this mold line I'm showing in this picture here. And an easy way to do that is you take a knife and hold it perpendicular to it and scrape along it and you can smooth, smooth that out with a, with a motion of pulling it towards yourself. There's some other things is uh, went over to um, Harbor Freight and you can get, you know, for $5 or something, you can get a, a set of files. Um, and do realize that if you see in this picture, all the files are a different shape. There's some flat ones and some round ones. And really you should, um, uh, use a shape that matches the shape of whatever you're filing. So we have a question from Levi, um, sliding blending, good to see you again, Levi. And then Aaron says, what uh, would you uh, clean metal minis any differently? I would, I do the same thing in metal miniatures. I would use um, either this, uh, a knife or these files team to work really good. I've seen a lot of people use the diamond uh, type files. You know, another thing we use is they have these like sanding needles. They're, um, they, they come with, um, you know, a grit pre-impregnated in them. I found that they like wear out super fast. And so that it makes me, me sad. Um, so here I was gonna, I'll switch to my camera and show you one of the things that I've done or you can do because it's fun. Just a minute here. So we'll switch to my camera. Okay, so here's one of these sanding sticks. And one of the things you can do, I think we're out of focus a little bit. What I've done before is when they get worn out or you can take any type of stick or dowel or anything and you can make something into the shape you want. So I've taken super glue and you can rejuvenate them by, I just took a piece of sandpaper and you just simply put some glue on here and you glue it to it and it'll start sticking here pretty quick. And then I put, once it, once it sets, I'll glue myself to it. I'll put glue around the whole thing. I'm gonna play with my focus here, see if I can get this. Just a moment here. Okay, so now it's stuck. And then I will wrap it around. Talking over the glue. And see if you hold it tight and then you just grab a razor blade. And 
and you cut it off and then you can have your own very inexpensive sanding sticks. I didn't wait for it to dry, but then you can glue it. And what you can do is also, if, if you have like a hard place to reach or something, you can cut. Sorry, I'm unhappy with this focus here. Let me fix that, sorry. Almost there, there we go. So if you need, if you have a specific shape you need, you can actually cut it to any shape you want. And then you just glue a little piece of it and then you carefully cut away the, the sanding paper. Or if you want it on this flat edge, you just glue a piece of paper here. And then after you're done, you just sort of cut it away. And then so then you have, then you can have custom sanding sticks. That's a lot of fun. All right, let's switch back. Let's forget to hit the share. Cool. So we should be sharing our screen again, I hope. Um, I do have a question from Rebecca. It says, files, do you have a preference recommendation between uh, ridge style files and diamond style files? Um, I do like them both. I just haven't taken the opportunity to buy one. Um, I, um, I, I mean, I use, I use these mostly. The diamond ones are super nice. Uh, they are very aggressive. Um, so probably diamond ones work best for, uh, for metal miniatures and such. And so, uh, the, I mean, but all of the above are great. Um, give me luck experience using a normal nail file, <coughs> nail file emery boards to remove flash. Yes. I, uh, nail files are fantastic. Emery boards are great, especially cause you can get them in different grits. And they even spell, they, they sell super expensive ones. Uh, but, you know, like you can buy a whole pack of Emory files and just and get um, and save yourself a lot of money. I think the biggest thing I see people as I, I watch them filing. Oops, let me, let me switch screens. Um, do realize that a, um, a file actually has a cutting direction. Um, and so, you will look at all files and they only cut in one direction. I see people rubbing them back and, you know, back and forth just as hard and files always go one direction. And you, if you look closely or you run your fingernail across it, you'll feel that there's a, a rough way and a way that you're just bumping on the, on the little cutting teeth. So it is uh, very good to make sure you uh, use your file the correct direction and, and, uh, and you only file in one direction. Pinning. Pinning is sort of important, um, especially if you're doing a certain gaming miniature and there's just that arm or something, and sometimes they won't stay or they keep coming off. So uh, one of the ways you can deal with that is to do pinning. You can buy um, little kits, like this is a Gale Force 9 kit where they actually have, you get the, the pin vise and then these um, drill bits and then, and then little brass tubes. And not tubes, but brass sticks. And those, those work great because it's really easy to cut the brass sticks and they've actually sized the, the, um, the drill bits to the actual size of the pins. And so that's just sort of convenient. But you can always buy your things. Like one of my favorite things to pin with is just paper clips. And paper clips come in all sorts of sizes and such. And, and I typically, and I use those uh, more often, but you do need a pair of um, strong uh, little, um, uh, wire cutters to cut them because they are a lot more difficult to cut than the brass. So, um, and I, and I use both, but if I know it's going to be like a high, uh, a, like a part that really needs um, high strength, you can do that. Um, Julie um, Guthrie also taught me that uh, if you need a wire that's even thinner, she uses paper. I mean, she uses um, staples. So staples are very thin, but they're actually can take quite a bit of beating and so you can use those to help with that. Yes, where, uh, Edward, thank you. He says, wear glasses when cutting paper clips. Thank you very much for that, that's true. All right. So um, let me uh, switch back to the camera here. I wanna show some little hints here. Okay. 
Okay, and then show you back to the thing. Now, so here's my here's my pin vise. I actually have a uh oh. All right, so I actually have, I keep a lot of my little drill bits in here. I'll use a bigger one for this example. Um, a lot of people I see that, so right, see how far this is sticking out? This is actually um, a, a piece of paper clip that I filed to be able to um, do certain things with. Most people will load there. the wrong one. smaller one most people when they put in their drill bits they will leave them sticking out like super far what happens is they'll flex so if you can see even if i just push on a little bit it bends and you'll end up breaking these drill bits and they're really expensive so you you always put your drill bit in only as far as you need to drill in and so I would typically do it this far, and then if I need to drill further, I would do that. So let's imagine that this, the bottom of this is um, something that we're going to glue an arm to. So I would typically drill in, and it's really hard to match arms up with things when you're putting pins in to get everything to match. So here's a trick that you can do. So let's say I've got that, and then I would take Um, let me find something thick here. So let's say I had to say this was the arm that I had to put together with this and I need it to match up really. So I put it in the socket and make sure it fits. You go, okay, these two fit together. And so the, the, what, the trick to get to be able to get it in the right spot, this is poster putty. So stuff you buy to hang posters on your wall. Okay, there's a little piece of fuzz in there. And what you do is you're gonna, so this would be the base model. And this is say, this is like a big old arm. You're gonna put a little bit of this on here. So I'll show you what that looks like. So I've put a little bit on here and I've made it pretty, I put a really small piece and made it pretty flat. And then what you would do is you would dry fit these pieces together. And you see that I've already got this hole here. It may be difficult to see. And then I'm gonna dry fit them together and I would move it around until it fits right, okay? And then I pull it off and look what happens. I, here, here's the hole and then here's the piece. And if you look, there's a little indentation or a little bump. And that helps me put the hole exactly where I need it. So now I can take my drill bit and I can go right where this bump is. And then I push in and then I just start drilling. And what this does, then I can pull this off. And then I would take my pin. Oops. And put it in there. And then, and then what will happen is I will get an exact match when I put them together. This pin, this pin I have is too big, but, but this allows me to get them exactly on. You can also put um, a little bit of, you can always put a little bit of paint right here also. If you put paint in there, and then if you touch them together, then it will leave a little paint dot also. So there's a couple of ways to do that. And that's really frustrating when you, especially when you get a miniature and you start painting it and, and then, and then, then you break it or something. So, and you've got to repair it. And so that's always a useful thing. A couple things that are useful. Is they always have an assortment of um, of tweezers. So there's normal tweezers, which are awesome. I use those too, and I have both types. And then I have these, which are, are preloaded ones. So I can actually grab something and 
it'll it'll hold it without me doing anything. So you can hold the end of it, and sometimes um, I need to hold it so that I can put that pin in. So I could grab the pin with another set of these, and then somebody that helps you that. So, so these little ones are pretty useful too. So any questions on pinning? Uh, the, Stephen has asked, is that hand drill and bits also available at Harbor Freight? I don't know if they have, uh, you just Google pin vices and you'll find a whole bunch online. If you want the whole kit, you have to go to the hobby store or Gale Force 9. Um, what is the real name of the loaded tweezers? I don't know either. <laughs> Does anybody in chat, can we get someone to pipe up with that? Uh, nope, I do. A, Tad has asked, do you do anything different to pin metal miniatures? I do the exact same process with metal. It just takes longer with uh, the metal and you just have to be patient with it and because it just takes a little bit longer uh, to actually drill those miniatures. Um, but just uh, sometimes with the metal though, one of the things I do do is I will, if I've got like an arm or something I need to add it, I will be careful because these tips will break and like you don't want to get it in your eye or anything. But um, a lot of times I will pre-mark. So I sort of, I, I put it where I want it to be and then I spin it around. And that gives me a little hole to start my drill bit and that'll keep it from, from wandering. And definitely keep your, remember to load them so they're not loaded too high so you don't break your drill bits. Okay. The the brand that for the the wooden tweezers, I actually I got them uh, two years ago at ReaperCon. There was a guy that just had that brought all these tools, and so I just grabbed them there. So I don't even know. Um, they're stainless India, but that's all I've got. But super useful for lots of things. Sometimes you just can't hold something, and it's great. Um, do you use magnets? Yes, I do use magnets. Uh, it's basically the same process, except for you use a bigger uh, drill bit and you just put them in and make sure that they, um, you know, sit flat. We have a question from Aaron about cleaning and I will get to cleaning miniatures here in a little bit. Let me switch back to the PowerPoint. Cool. So this helps get our miniatures all put together. So now this part we're prepped. Um, some of the, these are my, one of my favorite finds ever. These are called color shapers. They're, they're rubber tipped. They're, they're basically the size. These ones are the size of a paintbrush and do realize that this, they use these for painting also. So they have sizes all the way up to, um, like sidewalk chalk diameter, okay? So you need to make sure that when you buy them that you're buying the micro ones um, because um, it's in the pictures online, it's hard to tell the difference how, you know, how big or small these really are. And you'll, you'll see that there's five different shapes. There's a, a, a wedge, a rounded one, a, um, and then like a, and a pointy one, and then a cup. And so I, I, you do use all of them uh, because you're trying, when you're sculpting or trying to fill in the mold line. So maybe I put that arm together, but there is a, a gap between the arm and the, and the miniature. I need to fill that in. Uh, so typically I would take the green stuff and you mix 50-50. So, you know, part blue, part green. And I roll them into balls, two spheres, of, a sphere of blue that's one size and a sphere of yellow that's one size and that way you can make sure they're the same and then you squish them together until they're all green and then roll them into little snakes and then you can put that snake around the edge of an arm or something and then use these color shapers to put them in because they don't really stick especially if you get them a little bit wet. Um, uh, 
Viani, I probably said your name wrong, I'm sorry. I know this is not a YouTube video, but it would be great to have affiliate links to some of these products and descriptions below. I'll be, um, that'd be a good idea. I can put together a, a list of items that I've, that I've got for you. So I will put that together after. Thank you for that suggestion. Now these color shapers come in three different types. There is a white, which is very, it's soft. So if you were to push it with your finger, it's very soft. And then there's the, here, I will actually show you, I have them here. This class works really good in person because I can switch back and forth and show everybody. All right, let's do this. Okay, so I have three different types. I'll show you the difference so you can see how it's bending. Okay, so we've got um, white. Okay, you can see how soft that is. And then the gray is a little bit stiffer and then the black does not bend as much. So I'll bend them all the same. You can see, so super flexible, less flexible, and then super stiff. So um, my favorites are the grays. So if you're only gonna get one set, um, and see so you know, there's a little bit of putty on there and I just, push it, it just comes right off, which is nice. So the gray is my favorite. I do use the whites for some things. And then the, the, the blacks work better with like the baking type putties, like the Sculpty and such like that. So uh, number one and two, then three, but there are, they do have all uses. It just depends on what, what you plan to do. Mo if you're doing just miniature and some green stuff, then I would stick with the, the gray. All right. Okay, back to PowerPoint. Okay, so um, this is a the, so these are the gray. So if you can see how there's like a cone and then like a cup and then some different shapes and, and they all have their, their uses. And depending on like, if you're trying to get under an armpit, the one all the way to the right is a good one to sort of squish up in there. You can use also some other type things, which is like they have this Tamiya thin cement. So you, sometimes you get these metal wings, which they've gone away from quite a bit, but you'll get, sometimes you'll get an old metal miniature that has a lot of pitting and stuff. And so it doesn't look very good and you can paint on products like this. Um, this one has needs a thinner. Um, so I've not used this one a lot because you, you have to put the paste out and then use a thinner and then paint it on, but it's uh, pretty useful. Uh, for filling, most of the time I would use a milliput. This would be a, I like the yellow gray. The cool thing about this, this is a two part epoxy. The, the, the cool thing about it is you, can um, mix the two parts. Again, you would cut off um, um, the yellow and then cut off some of the gray. And I try to make them into little marbles. And you can see if they're about the same uh, mix, if I, my marbles are about the same size, and then you mix them together. Once this is mixed, it is water soluble. So you can add water to it and it'll actually turn into a paste. And sometimes I like squish it on the table and make a little bowl and you can put some water in it and you can mix it around to have a paste and you can use that paste to fill miniatures and everything and it'll still cure totally hard. Um, it's, it's, it's sandable and it's paintable. So if you're in the middle of something and then you find some big error, if you put green stuff on it, you'll put green stuff on to fix the error and then you try to paint it, it won't paint it. It just, it resists the paint. So then you have to get the Reaper paint on primer, you primer it and then you paint it again. Uh, so in those situations, I do like to use the Milliput um, because you can paint right to it and it accepts paint. So super nice when you're in the middle of something. I do, the gray is the activator on the Milliput and it tends to oxidize really quick, not super quickly, but it does over, you know, weeks and stuff, it will oxidize and make sort of a crust on the outside. So I, I keep it very tight in the plastic it's in, and then I take saran wrap and wrap it around that. And then I put it in another Ziploc bag to try to um, make it last longer. 
um, because even though it does oxidize a little bit, you can still, you just cut off the outside. It just becomes like a little thin skin. Like if you'd left um, uh, pudding or something, you get a little skin on the top. It sort of does that to the outside and you, it's not a big deal. You just scrape it off and use it, but uh, some hints for that. Another, and milliput actually has the properties more like clay. So if you were to, if you ever made a clay pot or something, you push on it, you see how clay is really soft and gets, um, sort of a cracky, it'll do that. Now, milliput, I mean, sorry, not milliput, but green stuff is a two-part epoxy, which is the yellow and the blue, and they mix them together in green, so hence the name. Uh, again, um, if you put uh, more yellow, it tends to be uh, more sticky, so you can make it a, a little bit lighter green by adding a little bit more yellow, and it becomes more sticky, and if you don't want it, if you want it less sticky, you can do uh, a little bit more blue, but most of the sculptors like Julie Guthrie and them, they, they add a little bit more yellow slightly than the blue. So you'll have a, a light green rather than a, um, a darker green. And that seems to work good. The um, milliput does not stick to miniatures very well. Um, the green stuff does stick very well because it's very sticky. And sometimes I actually mix some 50-50. So I get a mix between a very, um, uh, very rubbery almost, or uh, milliput, I mean, uh, the green stuff seems to almost be very organic. So if I were to do roots and stuff, it really lends itself to that, those types of shapes. Like, and it does not like to be very, like if I'm doing armor, it's very hard to do that with um, that. You can mix the two together. So I would mix milliput up and get it mixed and then mix the green stuff and get it mixed. And then I mix the two together and you can get some properties in between. So I get sort of a flexible, stickier milliput. So that's sort of cool. Do you use epoxy putty too? I do, I use epoxy sculpt. I like that a lot too. Um, epoxy sculpt is sort of uh, partway between uh, milliput and the green stuff. And so it's actually nice to not have to pull out both of those and mix them. And so uh, you do, and I do use the uh, light gray. Let me look at the bottle, hold on. It's a po I'll add this to that little thing. It's epoxy sculpt and um, it's the nat it's a natural. So it's just sort of, it's just a light gray because they have all sorts of different colors, but I like the light gray because it's, you can paint over it easier. So if you have the black, then you have to, you'll, the black will shine through your paint a little bit. So the gray is a little bit better choice. All right, so now we've got our model put together and we're, uh, stuck it together and made it all nice. So then we have to wash the models. So there's always, always, always mold release on models. And I can't tell you how many times I've not washed them and painted a model and then you get all the way down and then parts chip off or something bad like that happens. And it's just, uh, it makes me very sad that, that you, know, you put that much work into it. And, and then, then your paint job is sort of gone. And it's very difficult to fix when the paint flakes off. So it's always good to, um, to wash them uh, so that your paint will stick to the models better. So I would use a soap and water. Make sure you don't use uh, soap with moisturizers because then you're just cleaning it, but then adding oils back on it. So uh, dish soap type of things work a lot better. And I just have old toothbrushes that I have sitting on my painting desk and then I, 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 uh, I wash them for you. Now here's a pro tip, this is from Jessica. Um, she says, I, can ne I never like waiting for the miniatures to dry after I put water and soap on them. So she uses isopropyl alcohol um, because you scrub it on the same way you would as if you're using soap, but then the miniature will dry very quickly because the alcohol will evaporate. Um, I do, uh, this is pre-miniature holders. A lot of people have miniature holders now, which makes this easier, but if you don't have that, you can just grab a soda lid and some uh, poster tack and you just stick it on the bottom of your miniature and it gives you something to better to hold the miniature. I've found that when you uh, hold the miniature from the base a lot, you end up rubbing the paint off and then you have to repaint some work that you've already done. So this does that. Um, do you wash whiz kids? Uh, oh, so Matthew has asked, do you wash whiz kids? I, I think I would wash every, oh, but they come pre, all right. 
the whiz kids if it's the pre-primed miniatures then no but if it's um yeah they have a whole line of pre-primed and so i probably wouldn't wash those you're right but if they are the the raw models i would definitely wash them thank you that's a great question matthew all right so paint has three main ingredients as pigments which are the color and then there's binders to hold together when it's dry and liquid solvents or carriers such as water or oil to make the whole thing fluid enough to spread around or shoot through a nozzle. As the solvents evaporate, the binders and pigments and additives such as thickeners and fungicides remain. So the reason I bring this up is because we, uh, sometimes people will, uh, listening, I watch Anne's broadcast a lot and she talks about people breaking the paints and sometimes you if you add too much water or something then the binders aren't have enough there to be able to help it stick together and if we have oil or something on the miniature then the binders can't stick to the miniature and the paint won't stay there so it's it's good to know that there are some different ingredients in the paints that um, help the help the paint move around and help it stick um, so this <laughs> this on the reaper forums is probably the most contested thing ever but um, bones, you can absolutely paint those without, uh, without having to prime them. If you um, use a spray can, in the spray can there's an accelerant and the accelerant will actually melt the, the bone style miniatures. So uh, it is not a good idea ever to use a spray can on, on, a, on a miniature, on a, on a, like a bone style miniature. It works great on the metal miniatures. Uh, if you would like to prime a Bones miniature, you either have to have a spray type primer that you can run through an airbrush or a hand paint on version. Uh, and I'll show you, there could be reasons to paint those. So uh, one of the types I do like the Games Workshop, they're black and white. Um, I do like the Steinel Res, um, which is a, uh, normally get it through Badger and I normally get the white and the black. And I, I do like those, they can be hand painted on or they can be sprayed through an airbrush. Just realize that the binders on these are really, really good. So if you use your airbrush, you have to, you, you use it and you clean it right away. You do not let it sit because it'll, it'll stick very well to your airbrush. And the same thing, if I've used any brushes on this, you can't leave them sitting around very well long because it, it does a great job of doing it. So, um, I really like this because I can't, like I said, it's a real pain when you've painted stuff and then everything ends up coming off or your paint job's horrible. So it's worth it to do this. And if you're on a budget, the Rust-Oleum works great. Um, again, you can't spray this on the bones, but it works great on the, um, on the um, metal miniatures or after you've hand painted a, a layer onto the bones, then you can spray on top of that. Um, I'm sort of reiterating this. So one of the things I do, because sometimes it's very hard, especially when you start to know um, how to, um, where to put the light on the miniatures and what's supposed to be dark. And so a lot of times I will prime it black and then I'll paint white over it. And when I paint the white, the white is, where the light needs to be. So a lot of times you'll do the, the light from directly above and then you paint it to do that. I'm gonna show you some examples of that in just a minute. And this particular mini that I'm painting in this is a resin miniature. So it's not a bones, so it's not gonna melt. Um, but I, I paint it from uh, all three of those black lines. So I'll paint it from the top line, spin it 360, and then paint it from the middle line, spin it 360, and paint it from below and spin it 360 as I'm painting. And these will be just very light, you know, sort of dustings because you don't want too much paint. These are small and if I put too much paint on there, we'll fill all the, the lines. And so you're just trying to get a, a nice even coat over it. And so normally I'll start with black and then, and then I will add the white. And let me show you why. I'm gonna switch back to my camera. Oops, I need to stop video. Okay, so here's some examples. OK, 
Okay, so now I've got some, some miniatures. And what I've done is, um, these are all bones, so I had to use the airbrush to, to prime them black first. And then what I did is then I took, uh, I pretended that my light source is coming from above. Oops, sorry about that. My light source is coming from above, and so I sprayed these from above, okay? And you can see that it shades it from light to dark. So I have, so everything underneath is dark and everything on top is light. So let me show you here. So uh, if I go here, I turn them all the way up, you notice that the only thing I can see is white. And then when I flip them upside down, because I've sprayed from above, from this direction. And so, I, so when I'm spraying, I just sort of spray this way and spray down and it picks up everything that could do that. And when you're painting, even though I put color over this, you can always tell where your paint's supposed to go by pretending your eye is, so right now my camera is the eye and so I can see just white. And watch what happens when I flip them upside down. So now we're, you're starting to see some dark spots. And then when I go upside down, what happens? It's all dark. So when you add your paint job, you should still maintain this. I, I went to a class uh, with Jeremy Bonamont and, and he looked at my miniature and he's like, where's the light? I cannot see the light. You cannot fix this. <laughs> he's a French guy. So I'm not, and um, I was like a little discouraged because I spent a lot of time on it. And so I had to think, okay, what am I doing wrong? But he can't tell where the light is. And so as a starting person, it is nice to have these where you can, paint it so this would be a reason to paint bones so you'd hand paint it black and then spray it. you can use a rattle can or an airbrush and spray paint the light on it and that way it'll help you learn where the light's supposed to be and your goal is trying to make sure that when I turn it upside down it's black even when it's painted and when I turn it up side up side I should see light so all of these have examples of that so see we're light and then, then we go upside down we're dark and so when you look at a miniature, you should be able to maintain that. Okay, let's go to the questions here. Rebecca says, when hand priming, either with Steinle Res or Reaper brand or any other, I guess, should we thin the primer? Uh, it just depends on how thick. If it's like thick, then yes, but normally normally you don't need to. If it's you know, like this brand new bottle, it's it should be just fine. Uh, Steinle Res, I never, ever uh, thin it. So... Um, so I, I normally wouldn't, probably wouldn't thin it unless you see that it's thick, then no more normal. And then how do you sign it? Then uh, Diani asked, how do you sign, okay, oh, sorry. It's, how do you simultaneously spray and spin 360s times three and still avoid putting too much paint? Okay, the detail level, that's true. So what I'm doing is normally I'm going sort of, you know, I do, shh. so see, I'm doing a half turn and I spin them this way and do like sort of a half turn and then sort of a half turn. And so each spray is sort of, you can cover basically a half turn. So it's like, um, you know, when, you, when you're painting a surface, you should take your paint and you go across. So when I'm spraying, I start off of it, I spray and go that way. And it's about that fast. So when I spray, I go and then and then you do it. So really you're only doing like six passes, but you're not on it the whole time. Cause you're right. If you stayed on it that whole time and did all that, you would definitely, it'd be a one blob. Uh, so I, uh, Edward says, so I rattle can sprayed my minis for all my classes this weekend. Are they going to spontaneously combust here at some point? No, they, they will not. What happens is that if you do it right, sometimes it does nothing, but generally what happens is there's the accelerant in the spray uh, has properties where it sort of melts the miniatures. And so if you feel them and they're sticky, then that is probably from the, the paint actually melting the miniature a little bit. And it never seems to set. It always seems to be a little bit sticky or gooey, but a lot of times you can put paint on it. It still doesn't matter, um, but it's just good to um, not even get in that situation. Tad asks, do you lighten your colors, customize as you paint, or does the paint lighten because the base coat is lighter underneath? The answer is yes and both. So you, if you see, if I start off with entire black miniature and I put paint over it, you will see some of that black through 
and it always darkens the miniature. And you might want to do that on purpose. Maybe it's an evil miniature and I just want the whole thing to have a dark, evil feel. And so that might be a good way to start is to have that dark. And so that dark sort of always showing through. Um, if you look at Brahm and a lot of his stuff, he does, um, I think, I'm forgetting what the term, the art term is, but he, tar he paints very dark browns and stuff under it and then sort of wipes it off and then paints over it. And so then you, you get some contrast and you see a little bit of those colors through. Um, so um, very, so there's reason to do that. So Steven says, I'm confused. Can you talk to the 45 degree angle and 360 degree rotation PowerPoint slide again as it relates to top down light source with your right primer you're showing us right now? I think discussion of angles is throwing me off. Okay, yes, I have sort of mixed things, so I apologize. Um, for the different angles, that would be for your black base coat. So um, in this particular slide, it actually shows white primer. So that means that I primered that miniature completely white and I didn't put any shading in. If I'm, because um, sometimes you might want it just one color, all white or all black, and then that would be for that thing. So. If I were gonna do one of these ones that I'm showing here, I would do the black at 45, middle and bottom, because I'm trying to make sure that all the surfaces get covered. Because if you look under here, sometimes I'll see that, like sometimes I might miss maybe the, the armpit in here, like there'll be, you can see miniature through it. So I'm really, the angles is only to try to make sure that I'm covering all the surfaces completely. And sometimes you can't do it. And so then you just take a brush and then you paint in uh, the little parts that you miss. So I would start with the different angles for the black and then for the white, I'm gonna figure out where my light source is. For this guy, he was right here. And so I took my spray can and just sprayed it right here. And I didn't do any other different angles. So I might, I, I moved him a little bit to make sure I hit the back. And then I move him a little bit here so that he's, he'll be slightly off center just so I can see things, but you can see that the hand here got covered, but right here didn't. Um, so sometimes you might have to come in and grab a little bit of this, but I, I know that I can just fix that when I come in and it's the side of him. So I don't really care that it's super bright and it should be sort of shadowed under his arm. Okay, so hopefully Steven, that answers your question. Uh, yeah, I, sorry, Steven, I mixed two concepts together and I will fix that in the future. But good comments, I appreciate you bringing that because I'm sure others had the same questions. Okay, so let me go back to sharing my screen. Uh, which one's number two? That one. Okay. So she's back to the PowerPoint. Oops, sorry, I went the wrong way. Okay, so now brushes. This is another highly contended area and everybody has their favorites, but I do get lots of questions on, on what, you know, what brushes should I use? What do you like? So, um, I've tried a lot of brushes and spent a lot of money. So I, I just sort of wanted to go through some ones that I like, and maybe that could help you narrow down your search. Um, these are my two favorites. They're the, the Raphael brushes. They have the one on the left. You can see that it is a long bristle. These are watercolor brushes. And you can see that the, the barrel of the brush or the thickness is sort of skinny and long versus the 8404 on the right, which are also long bristles, but you can see it's sort of, they're chubby brushes. So they have a um, little uh, round, more a little bit more rounded on the side, and so they hold a little bit more paint. Um, I think I like the 8404s a little bit more, and then the Raphael 8408s would be my, my second favorite. If you watch Anne's show, she likes the 8408s a little bit better. So um, it's probably not a bad idea to, um, if you're just starting out, and you want to spend some money, then you can always uh, get, you know, the size one of both of them or the size zero of both of them and, and, um, and just give them a shot. Personally, I have um, two, one, zero, and three odd, three, zero, three slash zero. Those are the, the types I have of both of these. Uh, and, I, and I do really like both of them. Do you condition brushes when you clean them? Asked by Sean. I do condition brushes. Um, these are all natural hair. And so if you have a conditioner in your shower without extra uh, additives, 
it is not a bad idea to use that. And in just a minute, I'll show you some other things that will help you with some conditioning, but I do use a conditioner on my brushes occasionally because you need to take care of them. There's some other brands that I like, um, Windsor Newton Series Sevens. You can see these are, are more of the a skinnier barrel and a longer, uh, very nice. Um, you would be surprised that I do actually use the large. I try to, when I first paint, I always used zeros or the smaller ones and it would take forever to finish a paint job. Uh, I would suggest that you uh, use the biggest brush until you can't paint anymore. And then you switch to a smaller brush when I like, so maybe I've painted everything and then I need to do some fine detail, like a little tiny fold or edge of a belt. Um, and then at that point I do switch to a smaller brush, but most times you can use the side of the brush to accomplish that. Another brand I like, sorry, it's a bad picture, these Sharfs. Um, the Sharf ended up with uh, a lot of the um, um, the Raphael brush makers. And so um, I really like their quality. Again, you'll see they're more of a thinner, longer bristle. Uh, da Vinci's are also nice. Um, they, I don't tend to use them as much as if you see the brush lengths a, a little bit shorter. Uh, personally, I tend to like the brush lengths a little bit longer. Uh, and also with the brush length a little bit longer, you have less chance of getting paint into the, the ferrule of the brush, the ferrules of the metal part. And once you get paint into that, it makes your bristle spread. And so um, when you're loading your brush, you want to always keep to the ends of the brush so that you don't um, you know, mess up an expensive brush. Here's one of my favorite brushes. This is an, uh, a Hobby Lobby. It's a synthetic brush. It's a number eight. You can get uh, like 12 of them in a pack for uh, $5. And I do most of my base coating and a ton of work with these. Uh, I think the biggest difference uh, with the synthetics is that um, eventually the tips end up getting, they, they get a little curl at the end. And that could be a little annoying, but they're so inexpensive that it doesn't matter that it, once it gets a little curl man, it becomes like a gluing brush or, or putting powders on or weathering. So um, I never get rid of them, but I can use them for other things. Uh, so a lot of times I'll use a less expensive brush to do a lot of the, the heavy lifting. And then my detail stuff comes in with my, my good brushes. The, the biggest thing is, can you find a brush that will hold the tip? And, and that, that's what makes the biggest difference in the brushes. Um, so there's the list of the brushes we just went through. Cleaning your brushes. There's uh, several things that I've tried all of these. Um, the one on the left I have, you can buy little travel size ones. I travel a lot with my paints and so I have one that's about the size of a silver dollar and you can clean your brushes after you're, you're done with them and it's got a preserver in it. Uh, the Mona Lisa pink soap's nice. You just sort of put a little bit in the palm of your hand and rub your brush on it and it will, you'll see how, you'll be surprised how much paint comes out a lot of times. And then just recently, uh, James Wapple has turned me on to this, the Windsor Newton uh, uh, brush cleaner and restorer and that stuff works really awesome. Um, the, the bummer is that you can't really get a small bottle. It's like you buy the big one, but um, I've used it and it's, it's been worth it, so. Uh, and, and since it's got the restorer in there, it does help your bristles a little bit. So if you spent some money on a brush, you should really spend some money on some soap so that you maintain your investment. Uh, and, and again, the, the brushes never sit in the water with the bristles down. You, you wash them off and you lay them down or stand them up upside down. All right. So putting now we're on to putting paint on the, we've got all our tools and miniatures put together. So let's put some paint on the model. Um, I think the hardest thing is most people uh, can figure out and they end up eventually learning how to blend. And the hard part is, is where do I put the colors and, you know, and where do they go on the miniature and, and how to do it. Um, I found that um, you, a lot of people will start and the paint, like when I first started, we would paint the miniatures black and then work our way up to white. And it's a lot of work to be able to put uh, lighter and lighter colors on there and try to cover up dark colors. I've found that method one, if you start here, you just have a really quick highlight and then you can shade down very quickly, especially if you're doing a lot of army painting or have to paint like an entire bones collection for, you know, Kickstarter uh, for uh, bones five. 
then you might be putting a mid-tone on and then shading down and then throwing on a few highlights. And you can be a, a very successful doing that. So a lot of times I like to start mid-tone or a little bit above mid-tone and then shade down because it's easy to shade and then just highlight. Uh, when we have miniatures, realize there should be areas of light tones, medium tones, and dark tones. And that will uh, make the model more interesting and you have to realize that the light tones, there's barely any color in it. Mid-tones is where your color shows up. And then dark tones, uh, that is, you know, to show us where um, different uh, clothing changes or it's underneath something or dark areas. And a lot of times dark goes to black and so it doesn't even have color. Uh, so most of our color happens in the medium tones. And for our eye, we will know what the color is because of the mid-tone, not because of the highlight or the, the dark tones. So I'm gonna, we're gonna go through a bunch of pictures today. And so I want you to look for that and figure out, okay, how did I know what color that was and where is that color residing on the miniature or the painting? Okay. So this was my very first assignment in my college painting class. And he made us paint a ball. And and he gave us, we had to do it with two colors. I had, it was green, mine was green and white. And we had to paint these and I said, well, this is sort of a lame thing. Oh, I, I don't want to do this. Uh, and, but we still did it. And it wasn't until many years after they understood why he did it. He was trying to teach us that colors equal shape. And if I don't have those colors, then it's very hard to tell the shape of something. Um, so part of identifying where to put our colors is knowing how the light works on things. So let's look at this uh, example here. Am I missing one? Um, I've got a light bulb at the top and the light is shining on this, this item here. And right at the top, number one will be my brightest color. So if I were doing this green, then number one would be just white. And then number five is the furthest away and on the bottom, so no light shining on it, so it should be black. So when we showed you these, the miniatures that I pre-primed with white and black, when we looked from the top, we saw white. And if you saw when I flipped it over, it was completely um, um, black. Let me back up. Uh, Brenda had a question that I didn't answer. You said hair conditioner without other ingredients. What does that mean? Um, there are some hair conditioners that have extra um, like special coating things where they coat all of the hairs. And I don't, and I don't think you, you want to use ones that have extra chemicals that coat the hair. So you want more of a natural conditioner that is going to condition the hair and not put a um, synthetic coating on your brush. Uh, Cause you'll see that uh, interact with the paint and cause problems for your brush. So that's what I mean by that one. All right, so our light source is directly above. Number one would be white and number five would be black. And so number three is gonna be my pure green color. So my mid-tone is sort of in all the vertical surfaces. And it's really interesting that face, the front where it says front face vertical. When I first looked at this, I was like, oh, how is that a number three? But any surface that is vertical is going to be a three. So anywhere on the miniature, like even like somebody's hip where I go from uh, I roll up from the top to the bottom, or we can just say a big fat belly or something. So if you roll from the top of the belly, it's going to be white. And then halfway down vertical, it would be, uh, if he's wearing a green shirt, it'd be green and then the bottom would be black. And so uh, the number two will be a mix but between the green and white. So number two is a, a color in between. And then four would be a mix between the green and black. And, and then as I go around that shape, then we end up with uh, a blend from one, two, three, four, five. So here's an example, we'll, we'll take it to a sphere. So the top of the sphere is gonna be the brightest, so it's white, there is no color there. Five is gonna be black and no color. And then three in this color would be, um, you know, the mid-tone and then, Two is a, a mid-tone in white and four is mid-tone in black. Okay, so I've taken this model. Um, the artist has done an awesome job of 
uh, going light to dark. And if you see the hair, it's uh, very bright and it curves around like that sphere and goes to dark. So let me put them side by side to see if we can see some same. Even look at the face. Her forehead is light and it rolls around to her um, cheek, which would be three or mid tones. And then underneath her uh, jawbone, it goes all the way to five, like it's almost black. Um, so see if you can, in your mind, see that the colors go around there. And when we put colors on a miniature, you only put a color in the zone that it belongs. So number one should really be white or a very light color. And then, and then the midtones is, uh, that's how we tell what color her skin is, is that midtone. And then four, she adds a little bit of red to add some interest. And then it goes to a very desaturated dark, uh, you know, black mixed with uh, the dark skin tones. So see if I zoom in to just the forehead, that is not, like if I showed you that color and, and you didn't see the model before, you wouldn't know that that was skin necessarily because you just see a light creamy color. And so realize whenever you're painting the miniatures, you have to keep a, a zone that has a, a different color or it's, it's light, it has to be very light de and desaturated. See, and so let me scoot, I scoot in this, I took a cut of the face and I scooted it up right next to the forehead so that you can see the difference. When they're apart, we don't notice that they're very different. But if I put them right next to you, the other it's like, yeah, that forehead is white. And then I look at her cheek and there's like red and uh, colors. And then really you see most of the, most of the color happens right after, right above the red, you'll see where we get a nice skin tone. And those two right next to each other is what tells us that it's skin. Okay, because people's skin is, we, we have blood in our skin and that tells us that we're alive because we have these red colors in it. And when we paint zombies, they don't tend to have red colors. They tend to be um, missing those items. So here, now I've taken and I took some colors and I put it right over the forehead and look what color it is. It, it is really a light creamy yellow and it is not a skin color at all. So do realize because when I first started painting miniatures, I would paint the whole, like maybe if I paint the face, I um, would paint the whole face one color and I wouldn't add in lights or darks. And so that would be, I could tell it's a face color, but I wouldn't see the, the differences or the shape. And that's when, when the guy told me, where's the light? I cannot tell where the light is. It's because I didn't, I was not willing to put in other colors or, or to put in those lights or, or lighten my colors and have a range of light to dark. And that would that should have been something I learned from that lesson that that, that my painting teacher had us do by making those spheres uh, and going from light to dark. So hopefully you can apply this to your miniatures when you look at them. Okay, so now I've put it in some numbers. So the face we've broken into some parts. You can see where one, two, three, four, five is, and then on our cheek, one, two, three, four, five. Those are all different colors, and when you take your paints and put them on the miniature, uh, you always start the paint in the color zone it belongs in. So if I've got the white, white will always be touch one and maybe I'll squiggle it around or blend it with the two next to it, but I'll never touch it on five. And if I grab the five color off of my palette or palette or painting well or whatever, I will never put five where one is to start. You always start it where it is and then blend it with something next to it. And then that's how you get very nice smooth blends. And by doing the priming where I do the, they call it zenithal priming, where we paint the black and then the white to get that contrast. It sort of helps you as a, as a beginner to, or even me still, I still paint them that way. It helps me visualize where the lights and darks would go and it just makes things a lot easier. And then you'll find as things go on, you'll get better at it. Um, sorry for those who took my blending class. I, um, where I'm, I'm rehashing a few of my slides, but um, I think they were useful for this class too. Um, I've taken, this is a picture of this bull and we're gonna look at his horn specifically and look how the light hits his horns um, because our miniatures are gonna look more exciting if we can show the light. And if you look at any miniature, when you look online, you go, wow, that's awesome. And you think about why is it awesome? It's typically because the artist has done something well with the light. So we're gonna look at these two parts of the horns. First, I'll look at the green one on the right. 
So see the green one, the on the very right, the bottom of the horn is very black. So we've got black here, and then our colors are one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so there's a big area of, of black, and then the shade happens super quick. If we look at the the other part of the horn, the horn's larger there, and you, you'll be able to see, I'll zoom in so you can see that better. You'll see that we have a, a very big change from sort of a gray to a, a, a dark black on the bottom with a little bit of reflected ground, uh, ground on there. Um, so I've cut out the horn just so we can look at it alone because we're just concerned about the colors. Sometimes I can't figure out color, so I'll zoom into a thing to see what colors they actually are. So I'll take my computer or take a picture of it and bring it in. All right. So here, now let's just look at this. So if I just look at, this is our one value. This is a very light gray. And I can't, if I were to look at this alone and nothing else, I, I would not be able to say, yeah, that's a horn. I would just know that's a white color. So let's look at the bottom. The bottom's black. So realize we definitely want to put, we do not want to ever start a five near the one because they are very different. You can see how this, this picture, we, the thing goes from a one value down to a five. And you need to maintain that when you're doing miniatures. And then if I take a little bit more away, I can see definitely there's a, a three is our mid-tone, which gives us, tells us we're sort of a, uh, a grayish brown horns. And then I'll take everything away. And you can see how the, how the five colors, if we were to paint this, would go on this horn. And it goes back to our example of my sphere, one, two, three, four, five, you know, from light to dark. And this horn sort of copies the same pattern. Okay, so here's a couple uh, miniatures. I think they've done a very good job with light. We can tell the light is above them. It's probably above and a little bit to the left because you can see on their hair, the, the, uh, the light area is wider than the area on the right side of the hair. And actually I'm gonna turn my, my zone, my light tonal thing on its side, watch this. And look, did the miniature sort of follow this? Um, if you look at the master's paintings, um, they'll typically have the face is super bright and then they'll be wearing clothing and the clothing like a lot of times in portraits will just sort of melt away into the edges of the painting. Um, the dresses are very pretty, but we don't care about the bottom edge of the dress because the, the faces and the, them holding hands is more of the focus of this. And so you'll see um, that the artist has chosen to go light to dark from top to bottom um, to create um, some focus. So when I look at this, my eyes come up to their faces and then they're holding hands. So some other things we can look at is notice the light colors. There's, a, there's very thin lines there. And then there's the mid-tone area, which is three, and then that's five. So there's your five line. Look at these edges here. When I first started, the horizontal medium blue arrow would be where I'd make the brightest color, but that's not the right place for it. The lightest color has to be on that very thin ledge on the top of this because the light is above them. And then the, the vertical edge of that ribbon is a medium color, and then right underneath, it's very dark and black. So look at this. So we've got the top edge of the um, the fold has a brighter light on it, and then it rolls to the medium blue one, which is a lighter color, and then it's black in the very recesses. So we're all through the model. We are trying to maintain that, even though this we go from top being light and bottom being dark. They're still maintaining those those relationships between the light and darks. Okay. So the biggest thing I'm interested in this one, if we look at the Superman in the back, um, he's blocked out his, his colors really quick, but look, underneath his arms, he's put pure black. And then, and then several places on his chest and his shoulder, he's put uh, pure white because that's where the sun is. And so um, he's really blocked out his color, his, his light and darks, and then basically he'll come back in, he'll be able to blend those in and it'll look fantastic.
So it's a really good idea when you're starting is to put in some of this light and figure out where you're going so you know where to go. Uh, so here's a model you can see on the left is where he sort of just started putting some colors in and on the right it's it's more of a finished model. But I would like to look at where he puts the colors and the light. So if we look at the right there's everything can be associated with like another shape. So I just said okay there's a his head is a sphere and then his body and legs um, those will be cylinders and we can basically put the light on them like they were a cylinder. So uh, on the left, I've put an example of where the light is on the miniature. So on his rough draft, you can see he's put light um, in, in those places like they were on a cylinder. Okay, so now I've moved it over to the right here. And so if I had cylinders, that's where I put the light and, and you can see those are brighter parts on the miniature. So there has to be a difference um, along, along those. Okay, so because of the way that this is lit, I, I know that the light is right above him and the arrows show where you can see some lighter areas that the artist has, has put in. Um, so you sort of have to plan ahead and go ahead and do that while you're painting. Okay. So back to back to my the criticism from my my friend, and I'm grateful for him for being willing to ask me where the light is. And so um, when I go through a bunch of uh, artist paintings real quick, we'll just zoom through them, but I want you to pay attention where the light is. And so normally in class, I make everybody show me where the light is, but I can't hear you. So we'll just sort of have to discuss it. Um, so these are all famous paintings. Uh, we can uh, sort of tell where the light is by the reflections on his on his skin. And you see the kids in the background, their skin uh, is reflecting that light. Um, this one I'd ask normally at the class, where is the light from? And so it's upper right, you know, above her, because you can see her forehead is lit. And again, just like the other painting, her forehead is not skin color. Her forehead is is white with skin color and you can see all the way when we go back under her chin it is almost black and then if we go to her hair by her left shoulder um, it's black and so we roll from this forehead white to black on the, on the back side and the same thing with the armor it, it's very bright where it's reflecting the light and then it's dark on the other side okay so from him we can see the, the where's the light coming from ask yourself that so he's coming from his left and see how it's lighting up his armor and it goes and look at his face. What color is that light? There is no color whatsoever. It is pure white on the side of his face and then it wraps around to, to color. Uh, so, so realize I can have black on a face and white on a miniature that's in full sunlight. Okay, so this one we can see there's a little bit of light on her face. So there's some light coming through a window and hitting her face. And again, from behind her, you can see where, um, where you know, it goes to almost black in some areas. So it's good to maintain that. Now this one, interesting, if you're wanting to do light type effects, the lights are only bright because everything around them is really dark. So we think this thing's all lit up, but if you look at the, um, the light on his chest, it is just pure white. And then there's that thin ring of, light blue that tells us that these are blue lights and then all the red around it's very dark and and the white looks very bright because the things next to it are dark so if you're wanting to do stuff we have to do uh, have to do uh, both but again remember the, the three color or the kicker color is the color that tells us what color the item is because if I if I just showed you that center light it would just be white but because of the blue next to it, I know it's a blue light. And because of the dark reds, I know that it's uh, dark. OK, so now this one. Um, this one is more of showing um, there on the left side, you'll see lots of dark figures. And that just gives some interest because somebody's watching them. But the people really show up because they are 
um, they have richer colors and the colors behind are all grays or you take like green and add white to it so it becomes a light green which is desaturated so everything behind them has less color and so they show up really well because they have a lot of color in them and, and the ground that they're standing on is a richer green so that it's like a number three green versus the green that's behind which has had white added to it a little frazetta here uh, we can tell the lights above him because it's reflecting off his helmet and his arms but look under his arms his armpits they go to to black purples and you know under underneath his legs they're dark uh, and his, he's leaning sort of forward so you see his chest is dark so uh, when you're putting paint on things put the dark where the dark is and put the light where the light is and, and this will make your miniatures really pop so from him again sun's from the left and we go from light to dark so um yeah and I, I see all of these now and it's like wow why couldn't i figure this out because <laughs> it's like it's pretty obvious every single cool painting i see has has these same aspects and so if we can apply this to our miniatures then then we'll be very successful in what we paint um you know same thing with this this guy's face you look at um under like between his eyelid and under his eyebrow, you can see where it goes from, you know, four to five. So under the, there's the eyebrow, which you can see his hair, and then right underneath it, it's a darker color, and then it goes, there's a black line there. And then even right between his ear on his right side of his face, there is almost a black line there, but then it goes up to his forehead, which were super bright. So um, try to keep a full range of colors throughout the, the face. And then we know what color his skin is really because of the sides of his face. So just below the cheek line is that's where, where the colors tell us what color his skin is. Okay, same thing with this one. Again, we go, sun's up at the left, I can tell where it is. And, and you can see even on his chest, there's black on his right pec. And then, there's a very small line of black on his left pec, you know, right by his uh, sternum. And even on the, the shadows of all his stomach muscles, you can see that they're very dark on the, you know, the lower right side. Okay. So, well, this, I'm just gonna skip part of these. And again, we can tell the light is from the left and they've, uh, for the guy that's leaving, you can see that he's really muted because they've, you know, added either added black and stuff to the color so they don't have very much vibrancy. But then there's the guy that was stabbed and he's all in white. So he stands out a lot, especially uh, next to a guy in red and uh, green. All right, some things that will help you is the color wheel and normal color wheels are, um, let's see, let's go to the next one here. So the one on the right is a normal color wheel, which has um, green exactly opposite of red and yellow exactly opposite of purple. And what they did is when they made this, um, they equalized all of the colors. The color wheel on the left is based off of a, uh, a rainbow from a prism. And all the colors aren't exactly right apart. So we always say that red is complementary to green. Uh, but if we take the middle of green and I draw it straight across, it's a lot closer to magenta. So magenta is, is a, actually via the spectrum is a better color. And so you can get true color wheels online if you just type the words true color wheel and you can get this one and you'll, it'll help you make a lot better choices on this. Whereas the one on the right is a commercial one where they've made all the colors the same length when in, in nature they're really not. So here's a, here's a real color wheel and you can get this online and you can print it. And if I see if I've got you know this red, um, if I go red and I come straight across, then you'll see it's more of a, of a green going towards teal would be more of a complementary color. And so that sometimes can be helpful if you, uh, if you want to use that. 
Um, I do have this little example here. And I would, um, this is an optical illusion, but I would like you to think what color is darker, A or B? Okay, so to me, looking at this, A is looks darker, but let's let's slide this down and see what happens. So I'll split them apart and I'm gonna slide it down. And when I put um, A and B next to next to each other, we'll see that uh, that truthfully A and B are the same color. I know I've got it shifted down. A and B are the same color. Um, the reason that they look different is because the color is next to them. So sometimes I'll highlight something and I, I went up all the way to white and I can't look at, make it look any brighter and it's not showing up. So the only way to make it darker is you put something dark next to it. And B looks <coughs> lighter because of the things next to it. But then so once I move it up to A, then no longer they're the same. So um, it's just like the same example we showed with that guy with the glowing white chest. We put a very dark red next to that white and so that it looked like it was shiny. All right. Um, when we're painting, you do need to vary your strokes. And we're going to switch to a demo here in just a minute. And um, if you've ever seen someone paint a wall, if you only roll on the paint in one direction, you'll see uh, roller strokes or brush strokes. So typically when you're painting a wall, you have to paint two different directions and that will help. Um, Steven's asking, will this be available to watch later? Um, and yes, they are recording all of these. And so you should be able, you will be able to watch them once uh, Reaper places, puts them on their YouTube channel. All right. Um, I personally like to paint with wet palettes. And so basically that is a um, something to hold water, which could be a, a dish or a plate. I use the, the lid of a um, Tupperware and you can fold up a paper towel in it. And then you pour water in it to get that paper towel wet. And then you put uh, parchment paper on top of that. Um, when I first started, I always was thinking it was wax paper, but wax paper actually has wax impregnated in it and it stops water from going through. So that's not what you want. You want uh, baking paper or parchment paper because what it does it slowly lets a little bit of water go through and it helps your, um, helps hydrate, keep your paints hydrated. All right, so let's go ahead and switch to the camera. Stop share. Oh, I've got to choose. Rutarki says 20%, Arcos says 44%, Mercury's is 24, and the Cybers is 12. So get your votes in. So what I've done is I just, this is a piece of, um, this has got water in it. So this is just a, <laughs> this is one of the Ziploc little, uh, um, you know, containers. And then I bought some sponge from the hobby store, but you could easily just take a napkin or a paper towel and you fold it up and you put it in here and then put water on it and it works great. And then what I do is I'll take a piece of parchment paper. So I took it and I cut it up. And in this situation, you notice that I've, I put numbers on it. Now you'll see a lot of people that they'll put this on because it curls like this. And then they'll take the paper and they flip it over. But what happens when you flip it over, I don't know if you can see, see all those water droplets, that will totally mess with your, your paint consistency. So I do not like to turn it over. I'd rather you just put a couple um, paint pots and if you just put them on here, it'll eventually relax. And then, then you're good to go. I've put numbers on here because if you remember from our examples before I had, we'd numbered our sphere one, two, three, four, five and the face and all those items. So I'm gonna put the paint out one, two, three, four, five. And, and that will help me remember to put the paint in correct places. Okay. So we'll get rid of these bubbles and then we'll put paint out. So 
I know this is not a blending class or whatever, but I think it's important for us to try and apply the principles that we talked about to see if we can do some of these things. Um, so we saw these pictures, now can I apply it to a miniature? And I'm a visual learner, so it helps me to actually try it and do it. I guess I should have put out, let me put out the colors that I'm using. So we've got pure white. Lemon yellow. Lava orange. Lemon red. Nightshade purple, sorry that one's really hard to read because I got paint all over it, and then pure black. But really I've only said these, I'm just gonna put black on in case I need it. So I put white out, I put the yellow. You can use whatever colors you want. I'm just using this for instructional purposes. And they don't even have to be these colors because it doesn't really matter. I do like the purple. Uh, black is nice to shade things, but it's always nice to use a very dark shade of something. Use my pokey tool on this. Now this one's dried up, hold on. Oh, there we go, uh oh. <laughs> That's not a good sign. See my, I pulled my, pulled the top right off. All right. One sec here, it, <laughs> it went everywhere. All right, I cleaned it up. I'm good at making messes here. Okay, so we've got our purple. And then this purple's truthfully probably dark enough, but we'll just put some black on here in case I want it. We'll just see. But really, if you look at here in the, in the, on the camera, it is very difficult to tell the difference between the two. This one has a little bit more interest because it has a little bit of color versus not. So uh, I just sort of wanted to show that too, because uh, shading things with black always is not always the, the um the first choice so i'm gonna we're gonna play with this model here um i'm starting with my number eight super crappy synthetic brush if you look closely you can see see how the tip's curling a little bit you know you see how just the tip does that a little bit but it doesn't really matter because i'm just doing some some heavy lifting here and you can get a lot done with this. Um, so um, I did a very poor job of priming this. <laughs> I, I had gotten done with all my primer and I didn't want to clean my airbrush. So I, um, so I did it with my spray can and I'm normally really good at it. And I just didn't do a very good job because you can see my black is not very well defined in here, um, but it's no problem because we'll just, we're just going to fix it. But if I look here, I look from the top, everything's bright. And so we want those to be bright. Um, so I'm gonna start with uh, sort of a mid-tone, which could be, I could do between, halfway between three and four. You can always mix these colors. And it's nice because since they're next to each other, I can just mix them and you know, and notice that I'll have a full blend all the way through the color spectrum. So you can see I've got this full blend here. And I can, as I'm painting, I can scoot along this and grab paint anywhere along this line and then get tons of different thousands of colors just by where, depending where I grab my brush. Um, one of the important things when you're loading your brush is I only load like the very tip. And one of the things that I, when I first started painting, I didn't realize a lot of people were doing is they would, um, they just sort of touch the tip and look how much is on there. There's not very much. And if you watch Michael Proctor or some of these other guys paint, you'll see that a lot of guys will either paint on their hand or every time after they load their brush, they touch the paint here. And you see that some of this came off. So it's extra watery stuff. And now I have just the right amount on my brush to, to, to paint this on. 
So maybe when you're doing your, your first um, coat, you may not put as, uh, you might not wipe off as much because we're just trying to get some coverage, but I still want to maintain my light to dark. If you watch Marika, when she paints miniatures, she, the first thing she does is she'll come in and she'll paint black underneath all the edges like super quick. So everywhere that's got sort of an intersection, oh, I'm, off, I'm off camera, I'm sorry, I'll do that again. So everywhere there is an intersection, she'll come in and put these black, these black lines um, because she knows that there's gonna be a change uh, of stuff in that miniature. Um, so if, you're, if you've got up here primed, you can just do that. So, but we do wanna maintain stuff. And what happens is this line is really thick right now, but I'll take the paint and I'm gonna squish it up to make that thinner and that's, it'll mostly go away, but it'll still have that contrast to help me um, see better. Uh, some other things with the brush is when you load it. So I'll stick it in this paint. Okay, so I've, I've just touched it. And I've got just a little bit right there, if you can see that. Okay, and when I'm loading the brush, what you're not seeing me do is I'm actually spinning it. So if you've ever taken a pencil and put it in a little pencil sharpener, you sort of sharpen it. You can do the same thing with your brush. I'll load it with the paint. So now there's some paint stuck. They'll help keep the bristles together. And if I spin it, so as I'm loading it, I'm 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 loading. Sorry, I'm, I'm loading. I'm doing this, and it's like very subtle. You won't even see it. But what I'm doing is I'm sort of sharpening, sharpening that point so it has a nice point. So that when I go to here, um, it's a lot easier to control because I have a nice sharp point. So let's do the color in between. I I, you, you won't even see it. I've just, I just, I spun it twice sort of as I did it. Cause I, I'm, I'm pulling and spinning it. And then I can just quickly throw this color on here. And you see that I'm somewhat transparent and that's okay. Um, I'm trying to keep the color consistent. So right here, see how it's sort of um, pulled up. You just sort of grab that. And now what happens when I grab that, you notice that the paint was starting to dry and it left sort of a, a mark. So it's important to move around the miniature and let this paint dry. Cause what's happening is this surface starting to dry and I'll get a little bit of skin on it, just like, like a pudding um, skin. And what happens if I, if I brush over it too much, it picks up that skin and then it rips it like sort of, and it'll leave these little potholes. So it is really good to move around the miniature. So you paint apart and then move over and you'll come back. So you'll see people going back and forth, even though um, personally, I like to have something totally done. Like I'd like to have this perfect, but it's good to just move around because that's gonna uh, give your paint time to dry and you'll have a lot better effects. So I'm trying to get a nice smooth coverage. So I'm going super quick, just trying to get paint on. Um, okay, so let's go through here. And so this is probably 3.4 paint color because I've mixed some of the, the dark. Um, I am not touching the, I am touching part of the black, but I'm not going all the way in because I want it to stay. And see now this is dried because I painted something else and so I can paint another layer on it. Um, so by rotating back and forth, um, you'll get, you'll have a lot more progress and you won't be frustrated by uh, paint pulling up and making your life difficult. And I've even seen some people when they're doing this, they might, sometimes they have a hairdryer handy and they'll throw this paint on and, and throw the hairdryer. Um, so if I got impatient, I would start ripping up this paint here. So then sometimes, to, but you, the good way to fix it is, say you start pulling it up. What you do is you put the paint down, say right here, I pulled some up. And what you can do is you can sort of tap and it'll, it'll fill that little hole in and then you just have to let it dry. And so move somewhere else and do something different. Okay. Okay, so I've got some base coat down. Uh, so the guys that I've taken several, let's see, where does her cloak start, stop? It's right here. Um, another good thing is to move the miniature around so that so that, oh, I'm off the screen, I apologize, we better. Um, I'll answer that question here in a minute, Ryan. Um, I move the miniature to face the way that I need to do my brush stroke. And one of the things I'm doing is I'm putting my wrists 
Let me move this over here. So I put one wrist down and then the other wrist is down. So they're both sort of locked in on the table. Okay, so that gives me some steadiness. So now realize both my wrists are touching the table. Let me get this line back up here again. Okay, and then I can even, sorry, move my camera, now I messed it all up, this is bigger. Uh, okay, let me get this centered right. It's backwards, so it's always throwing me. Okay, so then I've got my two wrists, um, and then sometimes I'll even touch, see I've touched my fingers or touch my hands together, and that helps me be more steady when I'm painting. And then you always want to move the miniature around so it's easier for you to get your brush into certain areas. So I turn it over and then I'm, I can pull or I can push the brush strokes. Okay. So now we've got some nice coverage. And I've sort of got sort of transparent so you can see the darker areas underneath. So we still go from a light to dark. And then we can start to start blocking in some of our lighter areas. So I'm mixing this um, halfway between the orange and the yellow. And then we know the sun, the light's right above. So that's really bright. The top of her shoulder is bright. And it sort of comes down. So I'm putting in the ones where they're supposed to be. Okay. So this is, this is a one or 1.5 really. Okay, so I'm, I'm sort of throwing this in. And then I've got a lot of paint in my brush, so I wipe it off. And then I can push this up because it's gonna, there's hardly any on my brush. So look how much is on my brush, hardly anything. And what I'm doing is I've switched to using the side of my brush. So I'm using the side of my brush to rub paint on and there's very little paint here. And what I'm doing is I can sort of push that color up. And then you'll see that um, I'm starting to get brighter. And it's okay if this is a little bit brighter because I can bring a darker color over it because when the darker color, when the other color goes um, on it, it'll have a lighter color behind it so it'll appear brighter. So sometimes if you can't get something to show up, you can paint it really bright. So I painted the whole thing really bright here. And then I can go back to my orange. And then I, when I paint the orange over it, notice I have not washed my brush. When I paint the orange over it, it shows up better now because it has a lighter color underneath it. Okay. So um, let me put in a few more of the light spots so we know that the tops, remember like on the on that folds on that girl's dress, all the very tops of these folds need to be brighter. Okay, so I can put in bright colors everywhere. I'm supposed to have bright, so the very top of the shoulders, and then it'll taper off, all these folds need to be brighter. And then we can start feeding in some darker colors. So like I said, sometimes it's hard to figure out what colors go in between, but put in the brights and put in the darks and then you can just have to blend between. And then you just adjust the blends to what looks nice to you. So I'm gonna mix um, my dark orange with the purple. Um, I'll, I, I will go darker, but I'm going to start off with this medium color to see what it looks like. So I know in here is going to be a dark. And I messed up, you can just wipe it off with your finger. And again, I keep messing up, I just wipe it off. And even if you have a mistake, you can always get your brush wet really quick, and then you can wipe it off. And that will fix your colors. Um, so I need to have some shading here because it's really dark. And so I'm, I picked some of this, uh, this color here to sort of give me a transition between the two, but still maintain that very black line underneath. And the same thing will happen. So underneath this needs to be darker. Underneath each of the, each of these folds has to have a darker. And notice I loaded my brush a little bit a while ago, and then I'm working on other parts with my brush still loaded because there's just a little bit of paint left. And with this little bit of paint left, I can still darken some areas but not have a big effect on the top. Because we know that I want to be darker in here than up here. 
So I've already placed the paint here <coughs> and then I'll use the rest of it up top. And it's sort of a dance back and forth, but you can see we're already starting to uh, very quickly have nice color ranges. Okay, so uh, Ryan asked, I should have answered a minute ago, sorry. How do you choose five colors for those who are more verbally oriented? I'm baffled. Um, really, you could, we could just do um, two colors. We could do, well, maybe three. So we could do a, a red, and then we know that a good highlight for red would be a yellow. And then I could use um, this purple to be the other color. So now we're down to three colors. And here I've got another miniature. We can throw that on. OK, so here's one that I've done some different examples on. And so let's put, let's put the, the yellowish color on the top. So this part's facing up. Okay. And the very top of this is going to be, and I'm using, look, I'm using the side of my brush. Okay. And then I have to let this dry. Because see, I'm starting to get brush strokes in there because it's starting to dry. So you just have to let that dry a little bit. And so then I'm going to switch to a different color. So I can put this red in the middle. And it'll go down to darker. And I'll add a little bit of purple. And so I start the purple where it's supposed to be. So I paint a line of purple and then you can wipe your brush off. And then by just rubbing next to it, it sort of blends everything next to it. And I'm sort of pushing, pushing. Um, if you look, there's uh, lots of, the paint goes on, there's lots of little puddles everywhere. And if you've ever used a squeegee in a garage or something like that, you'll see that you'll be pushing water along. So I want you to think of, I'm pushing this paint along. <clears throat> and so for this red, for example, I put the red right here, but I want to tint the colors next to it. So I can wipe my brush off and then I can rub next to it in this little intersection. I didn't do it fast enough. Or I can scoot over and grab the, the little color over and I want to erase this line. So I'm gonna paint next to it and sort of erase it and move, move that water around. So I may move it up, but so I'll start. So say this is my number two color. I put my number two color in where it's, oops. Put my number two color in where it's supposed to go. And then I'll paint next to it on both sides, but then I have to squeegee it back to where I started. And then by doing that, I will get a nice, a nice blend. So see, I've got these two colors here. And because we're sort of wet, I can just sort of rub it and it will sort of blend in. And then I've got my darker color. So I'm gonna do halfway between the red and this. And then I'm gonna paint where there's, I can see there's a definite difference here. And then I just have to rub it on in there. So now the question was, how do I choose colors? And that is sort of difficult sometimes. Um, if you don't wanna choose, like this may seem sort of fancy, but um, red is typically highlighted by yellow. And if I mix red and yellow, I get an orange color. So it's pretty, um, it makes sense to go red, orange, yellow. And then, so, you know, it's funny, I have all these artist friends and they go, oh, you just add this color and it looks beautiful. And then I always think, well, how did you do that? And I'm a mechanical engineer by trade. And so I've had to sort of learn um, recipes and, and you start learning what colors sort of do good. And we know that um, uh, I, I could shade red with black, okay? Let me show you that color. So it becomes a sort of interesting color. Now, if I add red with this purple, notice how much, they're very similar, but this is, this is more purpley than this. And this black obviously has blue in it. So it makes things, so this, by using this purple, adding a blue to that, uh, red looks really good. Okay, so Ryan, how do you, okay. Uh, Ryan, so do you wanna, do you have any other questions? Or are we getting closer to answering that or not? So we'll let him chime in. 
And so this is vertical. So this is going to be more of the red surface. Oops, I'm off camera. Sorry, I got to remember to keep holding the miniature the right way so you can see. I apologize. Not a professional. Okay, so we're feeding some more red in here. And then I'll have to do a blend. So there's really quick change right here. So I need a color halfway in between to be able to, to, to blend that. And so see, now we've got a nice blend because I chose a color in between. And that's just using three colors. Now, if we look at this, we'll compare the two. So we have some similarities. Um, but we'll see how, see, well, we'll work a little bit more on this one and see what happens when we get done here. So really, I'm doing lots of little stripes of colors, and I'm just fixing the transitions in between them. And the colors are sort of close enough. And if it's not, you can pick a color in between the two and get something that, that shows up pretty well. So really, I'm very orange. So we're going to add in some red. Try to help fix this. And I'm I'm pushing. So you remember I was talking about the um, using a squeegee. I sort of put it where I want, and then I'm gonna squeegee it around. And then and you have to you, you put it where it starts, you squeegee it around, then put it back. Okay. So I put it down. And then I want to squeegee it up here, and then I'm gonna push it or squeegee it back into the spot where it was before. And now I gotta let it dry because I, I saw where a little it was starting to pick the paint up a little bit. So I need to move, I wanna work it some more, but I can't because it's gonna mess things up. So then I'm gonna move over. Okay. So then now there's a really drastic line right here for I go from this color to this color. So I need to pick a color in between and I sort of paint it next to it. And then by sort of rubbing it, it, it fixes it. Okay, and see that I'm using the side of my brush to do these high areas. I'm not using the tip, I'm using the side. So I'm covering these areas here. And then I've used a bunch of the paint on here. So then I'm gonna move up and use this darker color in some of the other areas that it needs it. So right under here, as we roll around, it has to go really dark here. So I'm gonna go dark red, and then I'll put a little line of black or the purple. That was a lot, okay, too big. So I'm gonna fix it so I can wash my brush off. And then noticed I, I wiped it off, but I pushed it into the crack. Okay, so it stayed dark, but then I fixed it and then washed it into the crack, so it still stays dark. And then I can, I can rub it a little bit to get off because that's still too dark right there. So it's always awesome to like, if you make a mistake, you just get your brush wet and just fix it. Okay. So now we're starting to get some contrast. So I can see some little problems right in here. So I know I'm not dark enough. So I'll put both my, the red. So I want this cloak to go a little bit more towards red than orange. And what I'm doing is the paint's almost gone. And so I wipe over, over this other color a little bit. So it tints this yellow more towards orange. So that was too much. And so I just wipe my brush off and I clean it. Um, so by having a, a lighter color with this darker sort of wash over it, it ends up creating sort of a nice, a lot smoother blend. Okay, so this one looks good, but it's still shiny, so I need to let it dry. So I'll work on these cut two areas that are still lighter that need some color in them. And then I'm going to actually go down to even darker because we want contrast, just like those all those other all those famous painters. If you looked at all those paintings, they all um, had areas of dark, and so we need to we need to do that too. So I'm going to go in here and paint. Um, notice I haven't cleaned my brush a lot. I'm still using color. So as long as you're going from dark to dark to light, dark to light, you don't have to clean your brush. But anytime I need to come put the lights back in, you have to clean your brush. Okay. So this looks sort of sad in here because it doesn't, it's very a dull color. 
So we'll throw in some color. In front of our cloak. So this, this midtone is really my kicker color. So this is telling me, because before we were super orangish yellow, and but now we're starting to look like we have more of a red tone to it. But I'm, I'm being careful not to touch my, except for I've done a couple washes over it, but for the most part, I've not really touched my lighter areas. Yes, I just grabbed a little bit of the orange which is number three. And we're gonna start bringing the colors up in some of the areas here. All right, so we have some questions here. Are you using the same Hobby Lobby brush this whole time? Yes, I have not switched to any good brushes yet. I'm using my cheap synthetic brush. Um, it is, it is uh, a fact that the synthetic brushes tend to cover large, blend larger areas better for some reason. I think it has to do with the, the makeup of the brush. And so I've been doing all this work. I've been using a huge, cheap brush to do most of my heavy lifting. And then when I come in and do some of these edges, um, most of the time I can use the edge of my brush, even this one, to pick out my edges, Let's see if I can do it. So notice what I'm doing is I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a, a stroke and I miss and I get, and I get each time I get a little bit closer. So it'd be like, let's see if I can show on camera. So I do a stroke and then I come back, go down, stroke, I miss, go down, stroke, miss. And so I do these things and each time I'm getting a little bit closer and that way you can control when you hit the miniature. So, so I, I miss, 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 there you go, I hit it. So this helps you sort of be able to get, there's too much paint on my brush, that's why I'm, as you can see, I can grab the edges of this, even with a big brush, I can highlight the edges. Okay, so we've got some questions here. Um, how do work lights, wait, how do you, sorry, <laughs> I can't read. Matthew says, how do you work light and darks on metallic paints on let's say a metallic dragon? Okay, that's a great question. So with the metallic paints, I would paint probably the entire, everything that needs to be metallic, I'd paint that metallic, okay? And you have to remember, you have to figure out where your lights are and you don't ever touch those with your darker paints. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna put in purples, depending on what's around the dragon. So if he's outside, it might be purples and greens. If he's in a cavern, it might be lots of browns. So you sort of have to figure out what's around him because the metal reflects. And so uh, metal does not reflect in the shadows. And when you've painted on metallic paint, that um, will leave a, a shininess to everything even in the shadows and so what you're going to do is you will go in and you will dab in and paint um, some of the darker color so you know like if this were the inside of it I would, this is the dark purple so I sort of put the dark purple here and notice I am pushing the the dark towards the dark so I'm, I'm scooting down so I, I first unloaded my brush on the miniature so most of the paint's gone on my brush see how much is on my there's nothing here and then now what I'm doing is I'm going further down and I make this darker and I push it to dark you know darker and push it to dark and so you always push or you're moving that paint or squeegeeing that paint to the area it is so I've got a dark color so I'm going to squeegee it to dark if I have light I squeegee that paint to the light and what you can do is when I I push it there and then what you do is you lift the brush up and it will leave that puddle there the same thing with the light. If I've got a light color, I, I start at the light area where it's supposed to be the lightest, and then I move it up to shade everything. And then I'm going to push it back, push it back, and I lift up right as I get to the end to leave it there. Okay, so with the metallic dragon, you need to have everything that's dark, you can just put in lots of different colors, and you just have to shade all the dark areas. Um, so it's the same rules, it's just you happen to have a metallic paint under there. Um, Matthew's asking, is this still base coating? Um, yes, I am base coating, but I'm also sort of finishing it at the same time. So yes and no. Um, I'll end up, you know, I'm getting close to having this actually shaded just the way I want. 
And then maybe I would put freehand or something else on this. Um, and now I'm putting some orange color in here to beef up my um, mid-tones. And then we still seem a little bit light in some areas, so I might put a little bit of dark still. So Bryce, you're getting really short on time. Okay, we got uh, last, let me put this last stroke in here. Do you have any other questions? Anything we wanna cover? Well, I thank you for taking time uh, to be here and, and listen, and hopefully uh, you went away learning something. If you do have questions, I'd be happy to um, answer those on the um, Discord in my um, painter area. Uh, just please ask any questions. And if you, um, someone asked me to put together a list, I will type up a list of items and possible places to find them. Um, and then uh, if there are some virtual tables that we can like open up a table. So if anybody wants to actually ask questions, uh, we can uh, just text me and I'll open up a table and we can all sit there and paint together or ask questions. Um, and I can answer those. Um, but I appreciate your time and uh, grateful for Katie giving her Saturday to, or Friday now, but to help uh, help monitor this class and help us uh, make our lives very easy. So appreciate that. So any last questions? All right. So if you have your miniatures, uh, post them in there. I'll be happy to comment on them or give you advice or, uh, or whatever. Uh, I, I think that we, we're better by helping each other. And, um, and so I hope that we uh, uh, would do that. And, and I would hope that you would uh, pass some of this information that I've passed on to others to make their lives easier too. And, and we'll have a lot better community if we do that. So thank you. Thank you.